So, grab a seat, make yourself comfortable. The screening will start soon. Right, so I know what robots you are looking for. You're looking for animatronics and robots in the movies with Matt Denton. Please give him a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, that's loud, isn't it? You should try standing up here. I feel like I've been at the bar all day. So I'm a bit of a lean. Um, yeah, so I'm here to talk about um, uh, control systems and techniques and a little bit of behind scenes stuff in the films. Uh, I've worked in the film industry and television industry specializing in control systems for animatronics for about 25 years now. And uh, a bit about my background, how I got into electronics in the first place. I came out of school and I started an apprenticeship in electronics engineering with Marconi Defense Systems. So that was a four-year apprenticeship uh, where I learned basic skills and there was a lot of practical element to it actually, which was very good. Uh, and we did a, like an ONC and an HNC in electronics software engineering. And I think towards my, the end of my apprenticeship, I could see that software engineering was much uh, more interesting to me, so I kind of diverted slightly halfway through. Uh, I then started a degree at Portsmouth University uh, in electronics engineering again. And uh, rather foolishly, I, I was offered a place in the second year. And I said, no, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the first year with my mates, idiot. And got bored in the first year and left to join the film industry. And I'm not saying anyone else do that. So any kids who today finish a degree because I never went back to finish my degree. And it's, uh, it's always bugged me. But I got a job. Um, I basically bugged some people at a television show and said, you know, I want to work in special effects. How do I get into that? And they said, well, you've got to build stuff. What can you make? And uh, I couldn't really make much at the time, but I did used to make models in my spare time just as a hobby. And I was really into Star Wars, and uh, so I scratch built this uh, model Scout Walker in my shed. And I took it back to them and said, look, I can make things like this. And they were like, oh, OK, yeah, we might give you a job. And they did give me a job over the summer. This was after my first year at uni. Um, but I wasn't a very good model maker. And they were like, what else can you do? <laughs> that didn't last long. So well, I said, well, I do electronics. Uh, and they're like, oh, OK. And they had loads of stuff that needed things like lights and bells and whistles and actuation. So I kind of ended up being their electronics boy. Um, which suited me just fine, because I was suddenly an expert in their company, because they had no one else who could do it. Um, but I was still learning a lot and, at the time. And uh, when I started uh, uh, with this kind of stuff, this was about mm, mid-90s, I mean, 93, 94, something like that. Uh, it was much more traditional control techniques for animatronics within film and TV commercials. And I'm sure most of you know, but an animatronic is effectively a robotic puppet. So it's a robot. It has motors and actuators inside of it. Um, but it's usually electronically controlled or hydraulically controlled. And quite often, there's a team of puppeteers in the background making it look alive. Of course, there's no real intelligence in it other than the people that are controlling it. Um, so to define a robot, it's not really a robot. It's a, It's a creative piece of robotic art. Your, your washing machine is more of a robot than probably what I do. But um, So anyway, we got into this animatronic control systems. And I started by taking traditional methods such as uh, like the controller you see on the screen. It's a very old one. It was like, these were great controllers. Some people might remember them. but And I used to hot rod these. Uh, so the little LCD screen in the top left corner was my own modification to the controller. Uh, to expand its functionality. And, uh, and then uh, soon after that, it was we were getting into stuff which needed like maybe 14 or 15 channels of control, which was unheard of in radio control these days. You know, it was, they were stuck at about eight channels. Uh, and they were all servo-based controls, so like hobby servers you use now, that's most animatronic heads still use them today. Uh, so anyway, there was motion control systems were out there for camera control. So what I basically did is took an existing motion control platform 
a well-known one at the time, and adapted it for animatronics. So then we could do, on this particular advert, this is a Lloyds Bank advert from the 90s uh, of a giant that roller skates down a hill. And his head had about 14 servos, actuators in it, which at the time blew me away. I was like, oh, wow, well, how are we ever going to do this? Um, and you can tell, that as you'll see these slides progress, you can tell the age of the photo by the size of my monitor and the size of the computer system the monitors sat on. So that was a 386 DX33 blisteringly fast with four megabytes of RAM and a 140 megabyte hard drive. I thought I'd won the lottery. Um, so yeah, so the, the systems were big, chunky, and adapted. And, uh, and it was fairly simple control techniques. It was more or less signal conditioning, input to output and uh, scaling, it's a tiny bit of mixing in there. And we could do, actually, on this system, you could record and playback, and there's some basic editing features. Um, and then, basically, I'm doing this, some skipping through in chunks, because I usually do this talk over about 45 minutes to an hour. So, coming out of working for this company, the dream at the time is to work for Jim Henson's Creature Shop, because they are the creme de la creme of all animatronics. And I got there at about 96, 1996, and I worked on a film called Buddy, uh, to spend a few weeks on Buddy. And I really enjoyed it. And I walked in there thinking I knew everything. And after three weeks, I knew I knew nothing. Because their, their level, their game was up here somewhere. But by that point, I had developed my own control system. So, because the motion control system we were using, the camera one, was fine, but it wasn't dedicated to animatronics. And there's lots it could do we didn't need, and there's lots it couldn't do we did need. So I'd redeveloped my own system, and I got into Henson's, and I was young and brash. And I was like, you want to use my system, not yours, because they had their own. I mean, developed it for years. I mean, they were the, the, the head of their game, and for some reason I thought mine was better. I have no, <laughs> no idea what I was thinking. but. Amazingly, they did use it, <laughs> and uh, we were doing a film called Lost in Space, and we built these two hydraulic uh, massive robots for the Lost in Space 1997 film, and at the time, their control system wasn't really geared for this kind of stuff. It was for small animatronic heads, and they were actually going to use the camera system that I'd based mine on. And I said, well, I've got a system that's dedicated for robotics, and it's based on the camera system you're going to get. So use mine, and convince them to, and they did. So that was the kind of start of my control systems career. Um, and these robots uh, were really another step up. You know, I'd never done hydraulics. I'd never done this level of control. That's me with a ponytail. I go through various phases of hair in this talk as well. Uh, yep, yeah. very complicated, and we didn't have much time to build them. Um, the control system, as you can see, the bottom right there is a massive desk of computers and racks, and the monitor is still about the same size. Uh, there's a puppeteer in front of it who's in a control rig, and it, basically the robot would copy whatever he does, so he'd have a slave input device he was wearing, so whatever moves he made, the robot would make. Um, and this taught us a lot about safety as well, because we had a very very near miss on this job. We built two of these machines, and uh, they were hydraulic powered. We had a guy outside of the stage on a hydraulic pump starting and stopping the pump for us, and he had a set of comms on so we could talk to him. And they keep the pump outside the stage because of the noise it makes. And then we had these long cables coming into the stage, the robot on stage, the computer system. The robot is on a platform there, and those cables dropping down through the platform, and I'm underneath, so that was my control station. And one day, I hear this uh, second unit were running. It wasn't my machine. And this horror story of the robot going out of control and flailing its arms around and stuntmen screaming and running and horrible, and it turns out that uh, someone had walked along the wall where we'd plugged our computers in and gone, I need to charge my drill up, and just pulled our plug out and plugged his drill in, and then he hears the screaming. <laughs> and what happened is there were the computers shut down, but they weren't interlocked to the pump. And the pump's still running, so it's got full hydraulic power but no control, which is terrifying. 
and our comms were also on the same main system, so we're shouting at the guy on the comms to kill the pump, but he's just going like, oh, do, 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 do. it didn't realize the comms have gone very quiet, and then someone comes running out and hits the pump stop button. So we learned to put in interlocks after that point. Steep learning curve. Um, so anyway, control systems evolved, and when I was at Henson's, uh, they were doing something called expression-based control, and that's really where um, my systems evolved rapidly after being there for a while. And it really started when I was on Harry Potter. Uh, so this is now about 2003. Um, the pony tail still exists, but look, I've got a flat screen monitor. Uh, check that out. That cost me 800 pounds at the time, and it was 800 by 600 resolution. Yeah, and, uh, and the PC is sat underneath of it. Look how small it is. That's incredible. So um, that's Buckbeak, the hippogriff from Harry Potter that I'm working on there. And uh, at this point, like I was saying, there was, uh, I'm into expression control. So rather than um, controlling a single motor with a single input drive, Expressive control basically is like, um, if I want to make the animatronic face look happy, that uses usually about 12 of the motors in the face, if it's a good face. So mouth corners, bottom eyelids, eyebrows, they all have to move together. And rather than trying to puppeteer that, with expressive-based control, you just create morph targets and you morph into a shape and everything in between. So with this system, I then had 32 output channels, 32 expressions, but all of those expressions control, can, can control all of those motors, and they all have multiple morph targets. So you could go from an expression from happy to sad to something else, all on one joystick, but add on top of that everything else you want to do. So on a normal character, we would have like a jaw movement, and I'm, the reason why I'm doing this is because you'll see in a minute, we use wall, devices called Waldos, which will track your hand. And we'd have a jaw movement, and we'd have an oo and an e shape on the thumb, because if you can go oo-e, oo-e, oo-e with an animatronic face, you'll get away with most dialogue. Um, and that's mostly all we can do. So ooey, 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 and then a bit of jaw, and then you'd have some other twist stuff here, could do stuff with the face, and you'd have another joystick which would do all of the eye control, and the brows, and everything else. And then the computer basically would tie all these expressions together, and, and sum them all together in a big mixer, squirt them out to the head, and suddenly you get this really lifelike animation out of it, because you've not got one person doing the eyes up and down, or one joystick doing the eyes up and down. Um, there were other techniques to do this, but it was mechanical techniques, complex mechanical techniques. It also took a lot of the previous models we worked on would take teams of puppeteers to work together. And this would bring it all down to one puppeteer. He could drive an entire animatronic face on his own rather than three people trying to coordinate together. So we used lots of input devices. Um, to help us with this. One of them is called the Waldo, as I already mentioned, and that comes from a short story, uh, a short sci-fi story from 1942, if you want to look it up. I think it's Robert A. Heinlein. Someone might correct me. No, good, got away with it. Um, so if you look in that picture, there's some of my colleagues here. This is on Harry Potter again. We were filming Buckbeak at this point, and the, he's holding on to one of the joysticks in his left hand. In his right hand, you can't really see it, but he's got a Waldo on, which is that device. So it basically puts his, device, his hand into a, like an electronic glove and it can track all his finger movements and his palm movement. Uh, and that, the re that came about because Jim Henson wanted a way of going from a sock puppet to an animatronic. And he said, well, I can do this. So you just figure out how you get this onto the animatronic. And that's where it all came from. And the reason it's called a Waldo is because of that sci-fi book and the character in it is called Waldo, and he creates devices to make his body stronger because he's a weakling in the book, and that's apparently where it came from. So, never read it, or hearsay. Um, so anyway, this is input devices. We make specific ones, we change them. There's a device in the background there, which are the legs of the hippogriff. I think the guy was sort of made a set of legs that he could puppeteer them. Uh, so we do custom controls as and when needed. Um, then, one of the things about control systems and computers is that quite often you're in hideous locations. 
So there's Buckbeak under its cover. We turned up in Scotland in their summertime, <laughs> and it rained for six weeks. And then when it didn't rain, the sun came out, and the midges came out and bit you to death. So it was pretty grim. Um, and that's actually the, the guy holding the umbrella was my boss at the time. It was Nick Dudman, who was the head of the creature department. Um, and that buck beak was entire feather coat made by a team of incredible, I think they were all women then actually, and they, they literally hand cut those feathers, hand dyed them, stitched them into a suit, and it's raining on it. So every time the rain came out, someone had to run in with an umbrella to, to save the suit. And then most of it got replaced with CG. So, and uh, I've got a little video here actually. I hope the sound works. Uh, it doesn't matter if it doesn't, just to show you the kind of conditions. Day one. There's a lot of cup of tea. And this is with my little shanty town, so I had to build my computer underneath the tarpaulin, hidden over the back of the set. And me and my mate basically spent about six weeks under this tarpaulin because uh, we weren't very prepared for rain. Because it was supposed to be summertime. Um, so, yeah, so it's not always, you know, everyone thinks the films are glamorous. It's not that glamorous most of the time. Um, and then a lot of what we're trying to achieve is actually uh, we build robotic structures, but we we don't want them to look robotic half the time because we're making creatures, not robots or droids. Um, so a lot of the uh, um, processes that I've spent um, in control systems is trying to hide the fact that it's a robot and it doesn't move robotically. Uh, this is the werewolf from Harry Potter with my with my good colleague Josh Lee building the mechanism there, um, and this was a beautiful mechanism again. Um, a guy on stilts and really uh, a beautiful, beautiful thing to watch um, in performance and one of the best animatronic uh, wolf type faces I've ever seen. And I spend a lot of time on it. Um, so I, I use a lot of filtering, it's like mathematical filters in, in my control systems. You can turn on a first order filter, it might mean something to a lot of people. Uh, it's just a mass filter, it makes things very all all kind of organic as in their movement, it dampens things down because uh, you don't want things too juddery and stuff. So I filter stuff a lot and we use acceleration and deacceleration curves to try and make things more natural. And we did this a lot on the werewolf. Um, uh, there's the guy practicing on his stilts and uh, he hasn't got the full costume on there. He's got the head on, he's got a cable tether. So the hippogriff, we nicknamed the heap of grief. The werewolf was nicknamed the Y-wolf, because we should never have built it. So um, basically, we got him on set. It was lovely. It worked great. And uh, he was doing really well. We had two guys in this. And this guy is, was a ballerina, six for eight ballerina. And um, the other guy that played it was a kickboxer. They're both very similar build. Anyway, get him on set and put the face on. And if you shut your eyes and try to balance, it's quite hard with your eyes shut. Shut your eyes, try to balance on stilts on rough terrain with a werewolf head on. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. And uh, we have a nickname in the industry for animatronic jobs that go wrong. They're called animatrocities. <laughs> that was one of them. Anyway, uh, I'll move quickly on, because this is Forks again from Harry Potter, and by this time I've got a laptop. Yay. And it's a Panasonic tough book. God, these things were like 4,000 pounds when they came off. These were secondhand on eBay for like 300, but I'm always somewhere down the line in technology. Um, but Forks was a beautiful thing. And I've got a quick video clip of it here. Uh, this is um, stop frame animation, just because it's a time lapse, but it does go into full animation at the end. And bear in mind, this is 2003, four, sorry, 2004, so we're quite a way back here. At this point, this is the most complex thing I think we've done to date. Yes, so now we're real time. So we made this like fake shift up the perch. It's just an illusion because he's just sliding along the perch, really. But it kind of worked quite nicely. Again, another lovely feather suit done by our uh, rest of the creature effects department. 
and barely used in the film. Um, so uh, I'll move on a bit faster. I've been given my 10 minute warning. This hexapods, I've been building hexapods for years. Um, you might have seen the mantis today. Hopefully the last Hello, hello, hey, I'm back. Do I get that minute back? Right, thank you. I uh, can't get the staff. Anyway, so the hexapod, um, yeah, basically I built dozens of these things. Uh, this, is, this was the most complex before the Mantis and it got me the job on Harry Potter and we did dress this one up to look like a creature and it was in the back of Hagrid's hut and it was in the back of uh, Mad-Eye Moody's classroom. Uh, with a skin on, obviously not looking like that. I think it looked a little bit like that in one of them. Um, so yeah, uh, but that's a much more complex control system and we'd never really done anything that actually walked. Most of our stuff is fake, you know, it's smoke and mirrors because we can use film and trickery. So that was quite interesting to do a real walking animatronic uh, and fully self-contained. Sometimes less is more. So uh, a film we worked on uh, called The World's End. Um, this was a head that we did, which was uh, a copy of Greg Townley, who was a stunt guy. And there's a scene in a bathroom. He's, a, he's basically a uh, plot spoiler. He's a robot. Gets his head knocked off and um, ends up with a head on the floor. And they just needed it to look alive. And so I was in charge of this, this particular project. And I said, it's just 12 servos. It's the eyes, the brows, the blinks, and the mouth. That's it. And the guy who built it wanted to put more in. I said, no, no, it's that shot. This is it. And this video went viral. Um, and I don't know how many hits it's had because it, lots of people nicked it and posted it up. But I'll just show you what you can do with a minimum amount and a very good skin painting job. I have to say, the, the artist who painted the silicon skin on this was stunning. Um, the number one YouTube comment on this, you can see on a big screen, I can tell that's fake. The number one on YouTube comment is, Fake, it's not an animatronic, it's a guy on his side with a white t-shirt on. Because nobody wants to believe that it, we actually built it. Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of, you know, that's a really lovely thing you can do and it's using the bare minimum. You don't always have to make it massively complicated. But there was a very skilled team on the art finish on that one. Um, so we move into Star Wars and um, when I joined Star Wars, my first job was to create a simulation of a version of BB-8. And this was a version which used stabilizer wheels. And I've got a video of it here. So um, basically, I built this in a virtual environment. You could drive it around the environment using joysticks. You could perform the head. We left the wheels on so we could show the director what he's going to get and how he could shoot, shoot it. So you could shoot it quite clean from this angle. Uh, and then we drove it up uh, a ramp, which was going to be the Millennium Falcon ramp to make sure all the torque in the motors would work and if it's going to handle it. Um, and then this video should move on a bit and you'll see, oh, there we go, a little bump off the top. Uh, and there's the final product. Once we built it, we imported some of the finest sand from Juicens and stuck it in a container and drove it around in the sand because it was going to go to Abu Dhabi. Um, this is us trying it in the back lot of Pinewood. There's some of the set in the background there uh, for episode seven. Uh, so it was really nice. So it was the first time I'd ever actually simulated something before we built it. And this was like a, you know, a game changer for us. Um, it saved us a huge amount of time. Uh, and obviously it helped because it was robotic rather than creature-like. It's quite hard to simulate creature texture, but when it's a robot or a droid, shall I say. Um, yeah, it's much better. And this was our first day on set, um, getting ready for the very first shot of um, episode seven. We were the first shot, terrifying. Um, so I tried to combine, we combined technologies a lot as well. So that was the trike, our radio control one, but we have puppet versions. We have lightweight ones that people can carry. And I've got a quick shot of the film here and I'll try and point out what's what because there's three in succession and they're all different technologies. So we've got puppet and coming up trike. And now we carry. 
So three different technologies, and that keeps people guessing because they're not sure what they're looking at. If you keep switching the technology, even with CG and animatronic, it's a really good way of stopping the eye, fooling the eye. Um, and just incidentally, that was the very last shot we filmed with BB-8 was John Boyega at the bottom of the pit there. And uh, we got wrapped like an actor, which has never happened to me in, in my career. BB-8 was such a big deal to the crew by that point. When they wrap an actor, they go, oh, well done. You've got paid loaves. Go by. And we got wrapped the same way. So I picked up BB-8 aloft my head and walked out with him. And John Boyega started singing The Lion King. So I'm like, hey, I'm so it was kind of fun. Um, and then, of course, we went on to build this guy. This came after the film. And this is probably um, um, my most technical achievement with the colleagues I built it with, which is Josh Lee, who did the mechanics. And that was the real BB-8. Um, we rolled him out on stage at um, Star Wars Celebration. And the crowd went wild because they thought it was CG. You know, they just assumed it couldn't be done. And um, I've got a friend here helped me today, James Bruton, who was also starting his own version of, uh, of a real BB-8 at the time. And we didn't know we lived in the same town. And some guy said, oh, he's building, there's a guy here building one. And I said, well, it's not me because I've not said anything because I'm signed by an NDA. <laughs> and so it was James and we met up and there we go. I'm still dragging him around with me. He's holding me back, I tell you. So, so uh, anyway, that, that particular droid took me on a great adventure. And I went to all, we went, um, me, and my, me and my colleague Josh, who built it with me, joked that we built it so we could go to a premiere. It's not a joke, we built it so we could go to a premiere. Because we, people behind the camera never get to go to premieres, so, you know, of course, they wanted BB-8 there, so they invited us. Um, and we are the only people who can operate it. Uh, so then some more advanced techniques, um, procedural, so software-based, so like auto-blinks, auto-breathe cycles, things like that. Um, kinetic animation is a new one that we're playing with, and motion capture. And I'll just show you this video clip of kinetic animation, because I know I'm running out of time. Uh, this was a K2SO test head for Rogue One. We never used it because it was CG, but this is basically all the animation on the head is based on the movement of my hand. So if someone is wearing this head, if imagine it's a creature and they're wearing it. If they look down, the eyes look down. If they look up, the eyes look up. When they change position, the eyes throw a blinking, because that's something that's a nice cheat. Whenever you move the eyes in a, when you're puppeteering, you blink, 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 blink as you move, and this just does it all automatically for you. Um, so you can augment this with live puppeteering as well. Um, so the processor in the head does all the auto, but it feeds in a mix from the puppeteer so he can take control at any time. And it worked really nicely. This was just a test. Um, and you can squint the eye if you lean over and stuff. Um, and from that, we went on and took it. There was a character in Solo, if you've seen Solo. Um, and as soon as I saw the um, concept art, I was like, we've got to use the system on this character. And it was possibly the, the, the it was made for it, basically. And this is a really short clip, because it's the only one I have. Um, but uh, that's, the, that's with the extra minute, right? He's giving me a two minute warning. Uh, so blink and you'll miss it, but here it is. This is, um, this is not puppeteered. Get ready. Ready, he's behind him. There, boom, that's all live. So that's based on the actor's motion of his face, all those eyes, and it was beautiful. And we had people coming up to us um, whilst we're on set filming that character, and people were back behind the camera watching a monitor saying, how are they doing that live CG on set? <laughs> and then we're like, ha! Gotcha, CG guys. Walk on set and you can touch it. So, um, yeah, we got into face tracking. I've got to move on a bit faster now. Um, and this was working lovely as well. Unfortunately, this company, this was called Face Shift, and I adapted it to plug into my animatronic system. Uh, you can't really see it there, but that the eyes on the animatronic were some of the best eye movement we'd ever seen because your eyes jitter all the time. And I have filters to do this, but you can't beat a live capture. And the blinks were beautiful, and we took this a lot further. And then the company that make the software got bought by Apple. And now those Apple phones with those bleeding character things that track your face, I can't use that anymore because Apple bought it. So that was the end of that. And it was the best software on the market. There's nothing else that could compete with it. Um, so that was a bit of a shame. 
Uh, more recently, we're into motion tracking. This is another test for a character we were working on. Um, so we'll try, I basically try and adopt any new technology into the control systems we use just to try and get the best performance out of anything. It's not always the right technology. If you can do it with rods or, uh, you know, just uh, someone holding something or a stick or whatever, it's fine. Uh, but there's certain things that, you know, work really well. Uh, and there's certain characters you have to use this kind of technology on it. It just helps. Um, so we never try and push things to make things complicated. In fact, if anything, I'm always trying to dumb things down. So, yeah, it's been a great journey for me so far in my career. Um, I couldn't have ever imagined working on a character that ends on Time magazine. And n nonetheless, we also got an award, a visual effects award from v VES Society. And again, like an as an engineer, you'd never expect to get an award in film industry because everything that all goes to the people who sit in front of the camera, mostly. So I've been very lucky. Um, and another high point of my career was getting to work on Jurassic World last year. And this was another big hydraulic rig. Um, so it was really nice to come back to the hydraulics after not doing it since 1997 and other than the Mantis. Um, and yeah, I'm very lucky to do what I do and I hope you've enjoyed that brief talk. I've got someone staring at me already. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I don't think there's time for a q and A. I I don't know. Um, Oh yeah, he's getting the mic out. He's got the mic out. There is time for a Q&A. Okay, cool. There we go. Oh. If you do have any questions, let me just start now and say I can't answer anything about episode nine. <laughs> so so if, if we can do leaves. two quick, oops, sorry. <laughs> two quick questions and quick answers, please. Yeah, two quick questions. Who do you want to work for next? Uh, so, so it's not working. Oh. Who do you want to work for next? Who would like to work for? Oh, uh, I'd quite like to go and work in the States for a bit and see what I've worked there a bit through traveling and um, there's some really interesting work going on out there with companies like Spectral Motion and, and, and Stan Winston's company, which became something else I can't, oh, Legacy FX, I, I, anything really. And I'm, and I'm almost considering moving completely away from film. I've done 25 years of it, I loved it, but I, I quite like robotic, pure robotics. I'm not clever enough, but I think I've got something I could add, possibly. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Last question. Hello. Uh, how do you avoid the sound of the servos moving, interfering <laughs> with things? Have you got a quiet actuator that's a, that you That's use? a really good question. We don't, and the sound guys hate us. <laughs> I mean, literally hate us. We have this constant, you know, we'll start doing a take, and six eyes, the thing with six eyes, has 62 servos in it. Um, the system I have now will do 500 servos, so I sort of said that's progressed through the years. They hate it and we'll do a shot and they'll literally come over within about the second take and go, um, can you turn it off? And we're like, well, if you don't want to see it move, and then it's a back and forth between the director and the sound guy. Does he want it to move or do you want the sound? And then what they usually do at the end of the day is they do um, uh, ADR dialogue, so they'll, everyone's on set and they'll just do all the dialogue again well, everyone's been quiet and they'll overdub it if it's that bad. So it's a problem. Well, thank you very much. Okay. That's all we have time for, unfortunately. Are you no at, at the village or somewhere? Where can we find you? Uh, well, uh, you know, if anyone's got any questions, maybe I'll hang out a bit here. I've got some giant, Le I was asked to bring some giant Lego with me. It's one of my side projects and I've got some here, but um, we could hang out outside or whatever. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Once more, Matt, thank you very much.